you know, we're, we're talking about corner crossing and pretty much all roads right now are leading to county attorneys being the biggest or, or final say on whether to mm -hmm. prosecute someone that the FWP cites a citation for. Have you seen any during your time here? First of all, no, I haven't seen specific cases relevant to Missoula County mm -hmm. on people getting cited for corner crossing in my 11 years here. Okay. Um, and again, sort of, uh, you were mentioning that this is sort of a political issue. Can you sort of describe that a little bit more? Well, sure, yeah. I mean, you've obviously got two sides. You've got sort of a, a traditional culture in Montana of hunting and fishing and public land access. It's so much of who we are as Montanans, that idea of getting outdoors and using our public lands. It's something I enjoy. I know, uh, you know a million Montanans do as well. At the same time, private property rights are really important as well. And so certainly, uh, you know, you can't go on to somebody's property without asking for their permission. Uh, we've got block management programs. We've got kind of neighbor notification landowner sort of systems to make sure that hunting and fishing gets that prior permission before they normally access. But corner crossing is a little bit different. And so it's pitting those sort of two different spectrums uh, against each other sometimes. Interesting. Um, we've got a few questions that we that we have written out. So how is the Unlawful Enclosure Act applicable to corner crossing? So wh which act are you? Do you want to? The 1887 one. Uh, in Montana? Yeah, it's a federal Act, oh, um, but it's basically just barring anybody from blocking public lands. Oh, gotcha. So I don't know. We're I'm a state prosecutor, gotcha. so I don't necessarily know every federal um, you know law yeah. that's applicable, right? Perfect. So my expertise is probably going to be more to Montana law, and yeah. I, I've never read that one, so I don't necessarily. All right. Know. Well, and I think another sort of the um, the biggest news in this subject is that Wyoming uh, Supreme, the the mm -hmm. one that went to the tenth district um what precedents does that wyoming case have on montana sure in the law we'd call that instructive it's something that we can learn from it's something that we may be able to apply the same logic and reasoning to montana but it's in a different federal circuit so it doesn't necessarily control the law in montana that's in the tenth circuit we're in the ninth circuit but the reasoning is basically the same right it's this idea of whether you can basically through the air step from one corner to another over public lands and whether you trespass on another person's property in montana trespassing statutes use two terms to talk about um, a situation similar to this premises and land both of those are defined as a physical presence like the dirt the soil something you have to step on something you could pick up and you could feel it does not refer to the airspace above it. There is some case law and some precedent of, you know, you can't unlawfully interfere with somebody's enjoyment of their property. So say you were flying an airplane just buzzing over someone's property all the time, they might be able to sue you for a civil trespass situation. The case in Wyoming, uh, nobody could prove that they actually ever stepped onto a private property owner's rights. And the case uh, that the federal judge picked up was actually a civil case. In that case, a landowner sued them for $7 million because he said he had exclusive and private right to public lands and that the value of his land was being diminished. And that's something I kind of have a problem with. Those are public lands. The public has a right to access those in a manner that's reasonable and necessary. And in some circumstances, corner crossing is what you know hunters, anglers, and recreationists have explored as the only way that they can get onto that property. Excellent. Well, and actually, you, you touched on another one of our questions, um, which was, how does airspace ownership come into play here, and, and does it at all? For criminal statutes in Montana, it really doesn't. Hmm. Uh, there are some civil liabilities in, in regard to trespass as well. So like in Wyoming, a landowner could try and sue somebody. That's not something that I'm going to have any say in. That's going to go through a different proceeding. We in the county attorney's office would be limited only to exploring sort of a criminal trespass and uh, stepping over a corner without any sort of damage to somebody's land I do not believe is clearly defined in Montana law. So it ends up being vague and ambiguous. The problem with that, if you were exploring a prosecution, is trespass requires us to prove an element of purposely or knowingly. They call it the mental state in the law. So you basically got to prove that somebody trespassed on purpose or that they knew they were trespassing. The issue, Bowen, is you could survey 100 lawyers in the state of Montana, 100 people involved with FWP or the Sheriff's Department or public lands advocates, 
and no one's going to agree on whether it's illegal or legal. We don't file criminal charges on something that's ambiguous or vague. The public has a right to know if something's uh, allowed or not, and we're not going to hold somebody criminally liable when you can't even agree on what it says. This is a great topic for a legislature to pick up. I think that's something they could do. They could clarify that corner crossing is legal, that it has no real impact on damaging another person's property, but they could also make it clear that if you do damage someone's property, say you knock down their fence, or you step onto their land, or you uh, kind of impede the use of their land in any way, that you should be responsible for that too. Because again, we have to balance that private landowner's right to make sure that their property isn't getting damaged and that they have exclusive right to know who goes in it or upon it, but at the same time, we've got a constitutional right to hunt and fish. We've got public lands that uh, folks want to access, and those shouldn't be locked up by uh, wealthy out-of-state landowners that are sometimes not allowing folks to get onto that land. Do you think that this is something, and, and now we're just being really uh, getting into speculation here, but I mean, do you think that this is a topic that uh, state legislatures could go after or, or try and clarify? Well, obviously, folks are talking about it. You are Bowen, and uh, a lot of hunting advocates certainly do, and I think there's even a private property organization in Montana that's tried to intervene in that Wyoming case and make sure that this is something that people think is illegal. So you've got this uh, uncertainty out there, and I don't like when the law's uncertain. I'm a lawyer, I'm a prosecutor, and I want folks to know what's legal or not. And so, sure, I think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, that being said, uh, I don't know what they do with it. I, I know there's a lot of strong opinions about this, and they do have to have a balancing act, and I presume that's why nobody has picked this up in the couple decades that I've been following it. Interesting. Um, let me pull up another one of our pre-written questions. And going back to the air, uh, do drone laws have any precedent over corner crossing case and, and that sort of airspace? Great question, and I'm not familiar with everything going on with mm -hmm. drones. I, I know it could be annoying. I had a drone hovering over my backyard a couple years ago, someone kind of watching us, and it's weird, it's yeah. creepy. And so I, I expect there's gonna be a lot of litigation and maybe even some criminal cases on things like that. There's a chance it could be applicable, but it is also different. Mm -hmm. I mean. In that situation in my backyard, it's like somebody was watching me. It was like invading my privacy. But we're, we're often talking about in corner crossing, remote and rural areas, out in you know fields and pasture, maybe timberland, of crossing from one public section to another. And it doesn't quite have the same feel of hovering over someone's backyard or their hot tub like a drone might. And so I'm sure there's gonna be a lot of changes on this in the, in the future, but really we're just talking about whether hunting Hunters and fishermen and women have a right to access some of those areas on our public lands. Yeah, and you know something that we we've sort of chatted about a little bit. This corner crossing does not just affect hunters. It's it's mushroom gatherers. It's it's sure. fisher fishermen women, but it seems like hunters are there's a little more scrutiny towards them. Is that fair to say that, like, does, does carrying a gun through these corner crossings, does that sort of um, put more pressure on them? Or am I sort of... Um, I don't know, Bone. I mean, you guys are doing the story, and maybe you've yeah. heard that from landowners, but mm -hmm. I would be really surprised if it's the fact that you're holding a rifle, the reason the landowners are upset about this. Yeah. What I presume is happening, because we've seen it all over the state, we've seen it in Montana, we've seen it in my home county of Gallatin, is we have a lot of folks that are buying up ranches for exorbitant amounts. Mm -hmm. These are ranches that neighbors and local community members used to hunt and fish on with their kids, and they grew up with that kind of cultural tradition of recreation to access in Montana. But we're seeing them closed out. We're seeing some of these landowners say, you can't hunt here, you can't fish here anymore. They're running outfitting businesses for ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 for folks to come from out of state and to hunt. And when they have uh, the advantage of that checkerboard pattern, when they have public lands that are locked within their ranch or their farm and nobody else can access it, it increases the value of some of that private sort of hunting. I really hope we don't end up going towards a model in Montana of hunting and fishing being privatized because in other areas of the country, that really is how it is. Uh, there isn't as much public land or they don't have things like streamside access laws that allow you to go onto any navigable stream and in the state of Montana and make sure you can drop a line. We are blessed to have those rights in Montana and to have that access. But some people are trying to change that. And that's personally something that I'm, I'm not gonna stand by and sort of be an accomplice in. And I wanna make sure that the average folks in Montana that are trying to safely and responsible recreate have the right to do that. Hmm. Let me just grab one more. So 
what is some of the legal ambiguity surrounding corner crossing? And, wh- and we sort of touched on this with like FWP's term of like unlawful. It mm-hmm. seems purposely ambiguous. Yeah, yeah, it does. I mean, if if the agency truly believes that it's unlawful, they should cite the statute. They should walk through the elements, and even the AG's office could give direction to prosecuting attorneys for how that should be applied. But you're not seeing that because it's not that clear. And in fact, for years, in a couple decades, FWP, through Republican and Democratic administrations, was basically saying it wasn't something they were going to enforce because it was so vague and ambiguous. We've had a change in the last couple years, and I'm not sure why. I don't know the reasons for that necessarily. But y- you can imagine some of the difficulties. you got a corner, four sections. And while two sections of public land touch, to physically step over that, you know, half of one shoulder and half of the other shoulder would presumably have to go through the airspace of private property. And that's really the theory behind trying to charge that as trespassing or uh, suing somebody for civil trespass. But it, it raises this really interesting question under Montana law. If you're not physically touching the premises or touching the land, have you committed the trespass? If there's no damages, if there's no harm to the land, what is the public policy reason that we'd be pursuing that? And I don't know. And you mentioned, um, you know, before we turned the cameras on, about this sort of Montana mindset. You know, there there is sort of a, a I don't want to say hospitality, but a, a friendliness. And uh, I mean, could you could you touch on that again? Of you know, you don't see this coming to you a lot in this area and do you think it is that that sort of montana kindness you bet it is i we're blessed to live in this state with just the the friendliest people and good neighbors that are kind of often letting folks hunt and fish on their property and i think that's why you don't see it because you can still go a long ways to a knock on a door or a friendly call asking for that permission and you might not even have to get in a corner crossing situation because they're going to say let me unlock the gate and you can just drive through my land and i think that happens a thousand times uh, maybe more throughout every season in Montana, and that's why we don't see a lot of it. I really think these are relatively isolated cases, really pitting sort of uh, this this idea of really exclusive private property without anybody getting near it or even being able to enter the airspace above it versus those folks that are just trying to get out and recreate. Great. Parker, is there any questions you've got? I guess um, <coughs> it would be more uh, opinion. I guess, but do you think that the wealthy landowner side of it, like you were just saying, does have to do with this corner crossing contention coming up more and boiling? Well, I do. I think that Wyoming case is a great example. I mean, there you have a wealthy landowner that bought up a lot of property in Wyoming and believe that his value associated with that is his ability to exclude others from accessing that private property. So he actually sued four hunters for $7 million because they used a ladder and crossed over a a corner of his property. And the idea behind that is if other people were allowed to use it, he would lose his sole and exclusive access. I don't know if he was running outfitters on it or or he just liked to hunt on his own on that property. But that's something that's uh, real hard for me to stomach in the state of Montana, this idea that just because somebody else can use public lands that you would have some sort of uh, $7 million damage. And the idea behind public is everybody gets to use it. And with some of this checkerboard and landlocked pattern, we we have folks that can't access that. And I I don't think that's right. That doesn't mean that every circumstance is going to allow somebody to access it. We're only talking about corner crossings here. And that means that there's already another public parcel that's touching that. There's a lot of landlocked parcels of public land within farms and ranches in Montana, and, and there's no corner crossing situation. And that's a different thing. I, I might not feel great about that, but I recognize that in those situations, somebody would have to drive or walk across a landowner's property to access those. And that's a different story. That's not what we're talking about with corner crossing. That is really moving from one parcel of public land to another. And that's something that seems pretty de minimis, really uh, vague and am- ambiguous in Montana law and not clearly legal or illegal. I guess uh, leaving this ambiguity in the air, do you foresee that there could be interactions, I guess uh, negative interactions between hunters and landowners? That's really what I'm worried about. And again, just using that Wyoming case as an example because it was well published and reported upon, you had uh, a same group of hunters return two years, uh, one after the other. And on the second year, the ranch manager was trying to prohibit people from crossing. And so they're physically there. They're trying to block them. 
they're creating a conflict. And the, the hunters, by all means, said they were going to do it anyways, right? And so you have this possibility of escalating sort of actions and behavior when people get really intense because of their, their personal views on the matter. And that's what I don't want to see. And that's why I think there should be certainty to make sure that landowners know exactly what their rights are as a private property owner and how uh, that land can and should be protected when there's truly a trespass. But hunters and uh, other recreators should also know whether they're allowed to cross over that corner as long as they don't ever damage anything and don't actually physically step on that landowner's property. Excellent. Anything else? We got? Yeah. Anything else you'd like to add? Anything that maybe we forgot to, to ask you about? Hmm. No, I don't think so. Just, um, you know, I already touched upon it, but one of your questions just sort of about people being neighborly, I think, is one of the positive sides of this. And we obviously report and talk about problems at those yeah. times that there are conflicts. But I think the reasons you don't see this all the time is most folks are trying to do the right thing and be neighborly and work with other folks to make sure that they're not unreasonably excluding somebody from a, a public parcel and they're respecting landowners. And I think we see that all the time in the state of Montana. And it's something I'm really proud of about being a Montana. I'm proud of that recreation heritage. I'm proud of how responsible most recreators are. And uh, I think that's sort of a silver lining of this is that we don't actually see that many because most folks are out there just trying to work through their problems and be friendly. Yeah, excellent. Hey, thank you so much for, for chatting with us.